So, Cliff, at the at the end of this month, will it have been 25 years uh, in the legislature? It was actually 25 years, uh, November 5th. Um, I was elected in a special election, so I'm one month into my 26th year. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I think Fred Akshar is in a similar scenario. He won a special election. That's correct. So he took the oath immediately. That's correct. But it's <clears throat> been 25 full years that I've been in the assembly. So let's go back 25 years. What did you expect when you were headed up to Albany? What, 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 <laughs> what were you expecting the job would be like? Well, I had a reasonable idea what it was like because um, being on the Board of Supervisors and then Chairman of the Board, uh, I did travel to Albany a, a different times to either be part of the Association of Counties or speak directly to RAP and Senator Anderson, Senator Libis. Uh, you know, over the years that, you know, we, we uh, communicated often. And so I had been in the Capitol, been in the session, a watch session at different times. And, and when RAP retired, uh, I had a lot of people come to me and say, we want you to run. Uh, it wasn't necessarily on my plate, but people encouraged me to run for the assembly. So I talked to Rep, but he didn't have anybody that was, uh, you know, lined up to follow in behind him. And so I threw my name in and it was a special election. There was actually four of us that had raised our hand. So there was an interview process with the party chairs and I was selected to be the Republican candidate. And the Democrats basically did the, did the same thing for their Democratic candidate at the time. Hmm. And to bring that up, how many times did you ultimately, over all these years, face a Democratic opponent in November? Only twice, 98 and 2006, outside of the first election. And that first one was what year? 95. 95. Yeah. So when you got to Albany, in what ways was it what you expected, and in what ways did it surprise you? I think a little bit more of what I, what I expected was just some of the procedures. Um, I was a little more surprised that the majority minority roles uh, and the fact that, you know, they were always trying to suppress the Republican voice in minority and they would do stupid things like, I mean, they control the spending of, of all of our offices and so our, our conference would put out uh, you know, cards that had bullet points on it for every bill that was in, in contention. And we would put them on different colored cards according to what maybe the issue was. And so they suspended the colored cards because they were mad at us for, you know, holding up a vote. And then we finally got that back and we just went to plain white cards, you know, that was not a big thing. But, but it was just a little petty stuff like that that they would do. Um, and we would do things that uh, to try to make them feel a little pain for ramrodding stuff through. Uh, at two o'clock in the morning one time, they brought out a bill that was, it was a turkey bill, but it was, it was basically done to waste some time because they had to get the, the majority lined up to come in and vote. And so we decided that there was 54 of us at that time. We called a quick conference and, and uh, d developed our plan. So, when we went back out, there was 54 lights went on to debate that bill. And we each had two 15-minute segments to debate it. And so they could see the pain coming. And they, after two to three hours, uh, the speaker came out, Speaker Silver came out and took his chair. And he took a motion to uh, end debate. And of course, they had the majority, so they passed it. But at least, you know, what we did is cause them some pain through their own rules so that we got beyond that stupid bill. We could go on and do something that was more useful. Gotcha. You mentioned Silver. How, how <coughs> many of your years, roughly, was he the speaker for? It seems like maybe about half your time? Uh, more than half. I think uh, Carl Hasty. time flies. I think Carl Hasty has been in charge now for like six or seven, eight years, maybe. Okay. And so the this, this speaker was, was there when I got there and up until the time that he was um, arrested and, and he re resigned, uh, he, w he was the speaker. And he ruled with an iron fist, both within his, his uh, conference and, and then also uh, over the majority. And, and, and th tomorrow, he could be one of the nicest guys you ever wanted to talk to. But he was a type of person that if he made a deal and you shook hands on it, the next morning 
he would try to pull something, you know, pull that apart and put something else in in favor of him. Uh, so one of my uh, colleagues and predecessors was, he said, handshake with him doesn't mean anything. And we, we saw that a couple different times because you might have the deal and then uh, it might fall apart overnight, especially budget deals. Do you think that was in part, for so many years, I mean, one thing you do have to give some amount of credit to Governor Cuomo for is the fact that he has managed to bring on time budgets to the state. And that prior is, to that, it, it was... Absolutely, absolutely. And I give credit where credit's due, and I, I, I give that credit to Governor Cuomo that he ran on on-time budgets, and he's been very uh, loyal to that, and I, I credit him with that, and he just uh, conducted himself a little bit more, um, I'll, I'll say, on top of the table as far as some of the negotiations. Uh, we knew pretty much what we were dealing with a lot of times, and he even, even brought the budget forward um, sooner than, than Silver ever did. Silver was the great procrastinator, in my opinion, because we never would even get the assembly calendar, uh, session calendar, until middle of January after we'd been in session for two or three times. And Carl Hasty brings it out, it's already out, early December. You know that when we're going to have session on certain days, and I mean, it's pretty well programmed anyways, but you didn't know when the committees were going to start with Silver, and that one year they didn't even start until like mid to late February. Uh, I mean, it was just, everything was run according to his clock, because he could. What, what committees did you, have you sat on over your career? Uh, pretty much the same uh, basic committees. Uh, I started off on agriculture and as, as a ranking member on agriculture. And I had economic development. That's a long line of uh, co commerce and so forth, but it's basically an ec economic development committee. Uh, I was on labor for a while. Um, let's see, uh, government employees for a short time. I've been on uh, as a substitute on uh, environmental conservation. But the last 10 years, at least, probably, I've, I've been on Ways and Means and Rules Committee. And those are committees that, especially in the end of the year, uh, we have long agendas, might be 130 bills on the, on the agenda for any one committee meeting. But uh, we go through them relatively fast. Uh, we ask the questions that we feel are necessary on certain bills in committee and tend to save the debate for the floor. Uh, and I think there's, you know, there's a lot of value in the minority having people that are willing to stand up and debate because we raise the questions instead of just the, all the herd of cattle, cattle going to vote yes. And I've seen, once we started with in-person voting, uh, when I got there, once you carted in as, and, and logged in as, a, as present, you are a yes vote unless you push the no button. You had to physically push the no button on your desk. But otherwise, we even saw people going back to New York City and they'd go back to their, their, their office, they'd go play golf or whatever when I first got there. Uh, you were a yes vote for the whole day, and the, a lot of the majority was that way. Uh, there was a Wednesday afternoon that we were, had planned, that we were told we'd be out of session by 3 o'clock, and they brought up a bill that we decided we're going to call a slow roll call on it, which means that everybody has to push the yes or no vote. They actually had troopers out in the thruway. We heard that they were stopping members that were going back to the city and telling them to turn around, they had to go back and vote. So it took us almost two hours to have a slow roll call vote that Wednesday afternoon. But they were a little more wise after that. So, <laughs> uh, But we pushed for the rule change, which we finally got through. Uh, you have to be in your seat to vote. And that's been somewhat suspended now uh, because of the virtual session, although we have the opportunity to uh, disagree with our minority leader or, you know, obviously with the majority uh, and, and vote separately on our own. Yeah. Um, what, what are some of the more significant memories for you of your time in the legislature? Well, it's, um, I, I, I saw history at different times uh, when Mike Bragman challenged the speaker for the leadership. Uh, that didn't go as planned, obviously, for him. He had, uh, at the time, I think it was 52 Republican votes that were going to support him to be Speaker. And he had a number of promises from the, the Democrats. 
and it fell apart. They got a call from the speaker over the weekend and, and promised that they would be loyal. So he ended up with basically uh, maybe 10 or 12 uh, votes from the Democrats and 52 Republicans. Uh, so his bid for the leadership failed. But that was a very historical moment because nobody had really challenged the speaker up until that point. And he was an upstate guy from Syracuse. He was a real good guy and a good friend of mine, actually. We got to be good friends. And uh, he recognized the need to, you know, balance some of the leadership to upstate. And he made a shot at it, and he lost, unfortunately. He was went from a, as a floor leader for the Democrats with a staff of 44 to, uh, um, I think he had a staff of one, and his office went to a cl almost like closet size. So there, there, was, there was pain involved, you know. But uh, another uh, historical moment was uh, when Governor Spitzer uh, was brought out for prostitution, and, uh, you know, alleging uh, association with a prostitute. And, and so basically, it, we were in conference at the, we were in a uh, conference with the Republicans uh, discussing some legislation that was going to be voted on that day. And one of our members saw on his phone that Governor Spitzer, you know, was being uh, inquired about alleging with a, or, you know, a, a relations with a prostitute. And there was no more bill briefing that day because you couldn't hold anybody's attention. So, but we went out and there was a, there's a TV in the hallway outside of the members lounge where you can go and get coffee. And that was just packed around there. And of course there's a TV in the lounge and all the Democrats were there watching him basically resign. And uh, he was another dynamic person that ruled with an iron fist. I didn't see any tears in the Democrats' eyes at that point in time because I, I got the impression that a lot of them didn't care for him. Uh, but that was a historical moment. Um, Silver resigning, and you know, that, that was something different that um, we didn't expect to see. But those, those are three instances that stick in my mind as far as, you know, the, the change of, of leadership that you see over the years, I mean, I can remember sitting there thinking, when are we going to get rid of Silver? You know, when's he not going to run again? Assuming that was going to be the only way we'd, we'd get a change. But uh, he, he basically brought it on himself. Although it took pre Barara to actually, you know, investigate and bring charges. I mean, looking back over these 25 years, <coughs> how significant a role do you think he played in New York politics and governance? I think he, he really did play a very significant role because I don't think any of that would have been brought, brought out at the time. I think it would have been hushed up. Um, but he was a, a man of principle in, in my mind, and he kept working on it and, and you know, basically was swimming upstream on it for a little bit, if you will, because uh, I think there was people that didn't want it brought out. But he stuck with it and uh, filed the charges, and, and you know, they, they turned out to be true. I give him a lot of credit. I know he's a Democratic prosecutor, uh, but I give him a lot of credit for bringing that forward because he knew it wasn't right. Yeah, yeah. and he went after leaders from both parties. He did. He did. And, you know, his, uh, he was investigating the governor, Governor Cuomo, uh, for a while, and, and of course that was a lot of things happening at the po at that point in time. You know, the ethics committee, and it turned over to a uh, uh, Jacob. Uh, they call Jacob, and I can't remember them. What, what the acronym starts stands for, but um, that's basically it's a political committee because the governor gets to appoint the majority of the members, and so I don't. I'm disappointed in the fact that maybe it's not as strong as it should be. Um, you know, I, I've I've always said if you want to look at my background or my finances or whatever, that that's perfectly fine. Have at it, because I go to bed with my head on the pillow and fall asleep. So. You know, I, I, I think that's maybe something good. We've got something a little better as far as ethics on it. And I know a couple of the, uh, my colleagues, or Republican colleagues, that are on the ethics committee. And well, honestly, you, you couldn't find anybody more credible to be on that committee uh, from, from our side. Uh, they're, they're good stand-up people. And of course, they're, it's a, a committee that's sworn to secrecy if they're investigating somebody. They can't just take that, you know, put it out on the street. But I respect that. I respect that. Do you suspect, though, that there is still the sort of corruption going on that Silver and Skelos went to prison for? 
I think there, there may be. I mean, you know, it's pretty tough to root it out. And you look at people and you'd like to think that they're being honest. But I was surprised over the years of the people that were arrested for wielding power. And uh, Tony Seminario, Seminario was one. And he ended up going to prison and dying in prison. But he was, uh, you know, taking bribes for the, from the unions. And uh, Tony was just a nice, uh, old-fashioned Italian guy. You couldn't help but like him. He was very, very generous in his, in his handshakes and stuff. But, um, you know, you like to think that maybe we've gone somewhat beyond that. Um, and and our, our finances, as far as campaigns, are much more transparent now. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, so if anybody sees something on somebody's campaign finance uh, donations and stuff, uh, you know, they can, they can have that investigated. So I, I, I think we're in a better place. I'm not saying that we're entirely pure with all my colleagues, but I'd like to think that 95% of them are, are there doing what they should do. What was your greatest disappointment? Uh, <laughs> I think over the years, seeing the minority conference dwindle down, when I got there, there was 54, and um, we could control whether or not, you know, if there was, you know, they call it veto proof, uh, because it takes a two-thirds vote in the, in the assembly to override a veto. And we dwindled down over the years because of redistricting to uh, 42 or, or 43. And I think we, we should, be able to have more numbers than that, but again, the way they construct the districts, because the Democrats in the, in the assembly uh, control the, the map making, and uh, and I think that's you know they've they've tried to minimize us. Another disappointment is that everything things are allocated different for the minority. The majority typically might be able to get bullet aid for schools and and you know uh, grants for this or that. Uh, not-for-profit to help them get through or whatever, or even going back to schools again. But we had a few years of that on the tail end of uh, um, silver until the, the budget reel got tight. But then, you know, that's gone away. We've had a couple of years that there was no member items. There was no grants that, you know, but what we've seen that come back now is the, as the economy's gotten better in the, in the mid-teens, uh, we've seen majority members be, being able to get member items or money, money for their district. And I look at it every, we represent, I think some six or seven million people in the, in the, in the minority. And they should have the opportunity to have some of those grants just like everybody else. Uh, when I had, you know, it was a limited amount of money, we didn't get anywhere near the same amount as the majority members did. and. But I tried to get it out to my fire departments to buy, you know, three thousand dollars to a local fire department. They can buy another set of turnout gear, or they can buy a couple more air packs or something like that. It's something that it's tough to raise taxes for, but yet we mandate that they they have to have it. Um, what were your relationships like with your fellow lawmakers? Well, I think that's one thing I'm I'm most proud of is is uh, the the relationships that I've been able to form on on both sides of the aisle. Uh, we've had a uh, new influx uh, in the last two years, a number on the Democratic side. And I didn't get a real good chance to know them it, it, because they might be on different committees. But over the years, I've always had strong relationships with the, the majority and had respect from them. And that's how I was able to get legislation that was important to my district uh, brought forward. And I've had a number of different pieces of legislation that uh, I started the development of but I would take it to a majority member. And because they respected me, they would look at it and say, well, I'd say, take it, you know, put your name on it. And so we would move ahead and get legislation passed. It was under their name, but yet I look back and I said, well, I got that done. I, I was part of, the integral part of getting that done. So I think the relationships is something I, I take home and, and I've had a number of Democrats that have said, now that I'm retired, we're gonna miss you. You know, and they don't have to say that, and I know they don't say that to some of them. Uh, I never played gotcha. You know, when I became ranker on the Agriculture Committee, Bill Parmet was there, one of the nicest guys, down-to-earth guys you ever want to meet. He was the, the Democratic chairman. And I went to him, I introduced myself, and I said, Bill, I don't want any politics involved in the Agriculture Committee. 
agriculture can't, can't afford the political stuff. And he said, I agree with you. And he was sometimes the only no vote against certain things with a speaker, especially budget time. And so he was a man of his word. He read a lot of the legislation personally himself. And we don't get a lot of time to read. Uh, we, we have to depend on staff to brief us on, and you know, we can call on any of the staff on what's in this section here, what, what's, what's going on. But yet with Bill Parmet, I you know, quickly formed a bond with and, and we took the politics out of agriculture. And when Bill McGee from Madison County took over as chairman, I formed a good partnership with him, uh, he became a good friend. I just talked to him a couple, the last week, see how he's doing, he's in, he's in a home. Uh, he's had some health issues and he's, he's in rehab basically right now. But, you know, I, I never went in there, if there was a controversial bill that going to be on the committee agenda, I never went in hoping that we could embarrass him by asking certain questions. Uh, we don't gain anything that way. And so I would go up to Bill or uh, Bill Parment or Bill McGee, either one, and say, look, some of my members are going to have questions on this issue. And so they were prepared. They'd make sure that they had the right staff person in the room to be able to answer those questions. Now, we might still have opposed that, and they knew that. But at least the, the questions that were asked during the committee meeting that should be asked, and then if it was a controversial bill as ranker, it was my job to initiate the, the, uh, the debate on the floor. And then my other committee members or anybody in the assembly could continue on with that debate. But again, going back to the in-seat voting, once we established that, we saw different times that because of the debate that we brought up, that they'd have to pull the bill from being considered. They wouldn't let it have a vote and go down in flames but they would pull, the, the sponsor of the bill would get up and say, I request that the bill be pulled from, from consideration because they knew they couldn't get the votes. And, and it was because of the debate that the, that the minority offered pulling out some of the bad stuff that a lot of them didn't realize because they hadn't read the bill. What do you make of the upstate downstate divide, <clears throat> especially when it comes to just downstate folks' perceptions of what we're all about up here? Or vice versa. Well, it's, it's definitely there, and it's very frustrating because I, what I see is downstate members writing bills that affect us upstate and going on what their perceived knowledge would be and, or the way they see it in their community. And so it was very apparent with the uh, farm, work, farm labor uh, bill that was passed here a year and a half ago that they didn't understand. And we had debated against that a number of years. And I, I kept, I was one of the lead debaters all the time. And I would always ask the sponsor of the bill if she'd ever been on a farm. Now, she was raised in Syracuse, but that doesn't mean she was ever on a farm or understood it. The answer was always no. And I always, oftentimes, I would invite her to come to a farm, you know, visit with some of the, the migrant workers there which I have done as ranker on the Ag Committee. I've been, visited farms from Long Island to, to Buffalo and North Country. And, and so I had a good perception of what real life is out there. And these workers that come in, they don't have to go back to that same farm. If they're not being treated right, they can go to another farm. But I, I was on a farm out in Hudson Valley, 1,100 acres of apples. and. I was introduced to the foreman on the job. I think he was from uh, Guatemala. And he said, how, how many years have you been here? And the guy very proudly said, I've been here 25 years. And he said, uh, you, we treat you like family? And he said, oh my god, yes. He said, when my mother died, he turned, the guy turned to me. He said, when my mother died, he paid for my airplane flight home to go to my mother's funeral. He paid for my airplane flight home when my uh, son was born. And so. A lot of these farms, they treat these individuals like family because they're doing good work and you've got to treat them right in order to keep them. But that perception fell short on the majority out of the city and so they basically pushed it through. Um, they put, established a, a, a commission with no farm representation. They had a representation from Farm Bureau, but that's not, that doesn't spell to me on farm representation. And they were going to, they was in, according to the legislation, they had to decide by the end of March 
whether or not to continue uh, the 60-hour overtime limit or what, could it go to 40 hours. We hadn't even, at that time, it was supposed to be last year, they hadn't even been through a cropping season. How could they make that decision saying the 60 hours wasn't working? The bill kicked in on the 1st of January, and they were supposed to decide three months later whether to continue the 60-hour limit or go to a 40-hour limit like normal industry is. So, I mean, that's the frustrating part that we have when you've got the majorities of both houses now centered in the city. And we're trying to have our voice heard up here. And, and they, they catered to, that whole bill was basically to satisfy labor unions. They saw 40,000 farm workers in New York State that they could unionize. And now, now you've got somebody from Guatemala, they're taking out, I don't know, $15 a paycheck for their union dues. What's he going to get from that union? He's going back in 90 days. Uh, I mean, so that's the frustrating part that we tried to get that across, but you had the, the basically the mass of, of majority members that, you know, voted because the speaker wanted them to vote that way, and they could placate the unions. I give my colleague uh, Donna Lepardo credit because as chairman, chairwoman of the Ag Committee, she voted against that bill. And we had a discussion. I, I said, you're the chair of the Ag Committee. You, you need to vote no because uh, you're representing farms across the state. And, uh, and she did. You know, she didn't, to my knowledge, she didn't have any repercussions from her own conference. But uh, she did her job. She did her job. We've talked numerous times over the years about <clears throat> the focus your office has had on constituent services and such, and, <clears throat> and you've given me a number of stories of times when you've been able to, to assist someone with just, you know, navigating the labyrinth <laughs> of <laughs> Albany bureaucracy. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, how, how has that made you feel each individual time when, when you know perhaps you've made life a little bit better for a constituent. It's a, it's a wonderful feeling, quite frankly, um, to be able to affect people's lives that, on that personal level. The legislative side is exciting and frustrating and rewarding and disappointing, all of that stuff. But when somebody calls your office, and I've had people call that they were literally crying on the phone because they were in such despair of what was happening to them, and within maybe a couple days, a couple weeks, whatever, depending on what the issue was, we changed their life because we got into the, the agency that was regulating it or we got to the company that was uh, coming down hard on them, insurance companies for one, but uh, be able to bring some daylight in and kind of help them get through this. Sometimes I've had uh, insurance companies turn around and say, okay, we'll pay the bill. You know, it, and it was basically, a paying for a helicopter or ambulance or, or operation or something like that. I had no power over the insurance company except maybe the power of influence because of my, my job. But when you do things like that and you go home at night, uh, you know, you put your head on the pillow and you thank God you had an opportunity to do it. And I, I just helped a, 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 an attorney here a couple, about three weeks ago. Uh, selling a home from a woman that had died. It was her estate. They had a buyer. He had a guarantee of, of uh, insurance or uh, interest rates. But the time was, they needed a, a document out of the Department of State, and the time was running short. They were going to lose this buyer because the bank would only guarantee the interest rate for X number of days. And it took a couple of emails, but we got the Department of, actually it was Department of Taxation, not Department of State, but we got them to recognize the, the necess necessity to do this on time. And so they found it and they called the attorney's office and, and I haven't heard anything since, so I assume that that sale went through. So obviously you've, you've had a front row seat for some Albany politics, but there's, you know, there's local politics as well. Mm -hmm. Do you mind if I ask you what it was like working with the late Senator Lewis? You know, Senator Libis and I always had a, a good relationship. Uh, we, we could disagree on an issue, and there's times when I voted against something that he voted for. But out of respect for him, I never made a big deal out of that uh, because he knew that I had to represent my district as I saw it, and he had to represent his district as he saw it. 
And, and so that's the way we operated. Um, I just felt that each one of us has a job to do with sometimes a cross constituency, but sometimes totally different constituency. And so we, we always got along. I, I respected him, worked with him a lot of times on different things. And um, I remember the, we would quite often talk to a group of people that would come to Albany, uh, quite a conservative group, and it was 125, 150 people in the room. And they didn't like his vote on this one bill. And he was at the negotiating table to get it to the point where both houses would agree to it. And he said, I'm sorry, but he, I was part of the negotiations. I've got to support it. And everybody was going, no, no, vote no. And then he got a phone call. They were having a vote on the, on the Senate floor. And he said, well, you've got to excuse me. I, I'm the floor leader. And so he left. And they were kind of grumbling. And I said, well, wait a minute. We should be happy that we've got somebody in Senator Libis's position that they were actually at the negotiating table. And I said, you've got to understand compromise. There's times we have to compromise. We don't get everything that we want. And they don't get everything that they want. But we come to a point where we can move forward. And I said, if you don't believe in compromise, you need to read the book, Plain, Honest Men. It's all about the summer of 1787, when the Constitution that we live by was drafted. And the arguments that went through that whole summer and the compromise that happened. And I said, you need to read that and understand the compromise that, was, that went on to get to this point. And I said, we need to thank Senator Libis for being in the position that he's in. Nobody said a word. So <laughs> I, I don't know how many I won over, but they didn't argue. <laughs> I mean, really, when you look back on his career, obviously he was in the majority and for a significant amount of time had a very close relationship with Governor Pataki. Also seemed to develop one in, in for a while, the final yeah. years with Governor Cuomo. Do you think people around here really have a full appreciation of, of what he was able to do for our area when you just think of some of the major projects and such? Yeah, I think there is an appreciation there. There's a little bit of disappointment, obviously, with his final couple of years, what was going on. But um, I think there's an appreciation for over the years that he was able to help in a lot of ways. He was able to bring jobs into the southern tier. And, and um, his relationship with the Governor Pataki, I think, was good and strong. And, and I think it was uh, something that really we here in the Southern Tier we benefited from. And, you know, we were able to expand the Department of Labor and, and uh, workers' comp jobs here in the Southern Tier. And that wouldn't have happened, uh, say, under Cuomo. There was some discussion about taking him out, I think. And, and I, I think out of respect for the senator, that, that didn't happen. But, you know, it's... it's um, it's tough to go out on a negative because that's what people tend to, to relive and talk about. But there's a lot of projects and stuff that he had his fingerprints on. And um, I, I, I give credit where credit's due, like I said. I, I get, always give him credit for doing the good things. Yeah. What, what will you miss about being a legislator? I, I think the relationships. The, you, you miss the people. You don't necessarily miss the process. Um, you know, they, they have no time clock up there, and that's the frustrating thing. Even, even uh, uh, Monday, uh, yesterday, we had our Zoom session, which was supposed to start at noon, but didn't start until 10 of 1. So, you know, if they tell me they we're going to start at noon, I, I'm there at 10 of. And so a group of us, it was 80, 90 people on that Zoom call waiting for it to start, until they got, they ended up with 155 people on the Zoom call uh, for session. But it didn't start till 10 of 1. We got over with, it was all done by quarter after 1, 20 after. And that's the frustrating part, the lack of respect for everybody's time. When you're in Albany, you're there for two, three, four days maybe, you've got a lot to get done, get caught up on your Albany paperwork, and there's people that want you to call them back, and they want to come in your office and visit you don't have time to just sit there and do nothing. And that's the, one of the frustrating things. I, I would go to the chamber because we were going to start at, let's say, 2 o'clock. I would be there, quarter of, 10 of, and clock in. And then we'd sit there till maybe 3 o'clock before they banged the gavel. And then there's times when they decided before 
2.30 that they're going to have a conference. We haven't even gaveled in yet, but they might be in a conference for an hour, hour and a half. And no respect for anybody else. You know, they didn't say we're going to, you know, have a conference at 1.30 or 2.30 or whatever. Uh, they just did it. And so that's, you know, I won't miss that. Uh, <laughs> But I got to work with a tremendous amount of good people, both in, in the legislature and, and even the background staff. We have uh, both conferences, the minority and majority, they have background people for research. Uh, you call with a question on education that I, I can't give you the answer, but I contact my research people. That's their expertise. They'll come back with an answer that you'll accept as, as a sane answer. Uh, ways and means people, funding issues, you know, I can call them, they'll dig into the budget, come back to me and say, you know, this is what it is. Um, you know, they're such good people and I've seen, we've been in session at times where the Ways and Means staff would go 48 hours basically with no sleep because they would get another budget bill at 11 o'clock at night after we'd maybe gaveled out at 11 o'clock and they'd get a new budget bill that they had to go through and be able to brief our conference by 9.30 the next morning. And God bless them. I mean, because they they look pretty weary at at the end of two days, but uh, they always knew their stuff. They always knew their stuff. They had gone through that and picked it apart. And um, you know, those people, I can't express how much they've they've meant over the years because they're part of. They always made me look good, and you know, they they put their families on hold, and and they were there 48 hours straight. And, and did, did their job. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, I'll, I'll miss working with those people, tremendous people. Yeah. How about your office staff, and is Joe uh, retaining any of them? Joe's going to be able to retain the office staff, um, which I'm very pleased about. And my office staff, I mean, they're like family. Um, <clears throat> we just, we've always clicked and gotten along wonderfully, and I've always, I treat them like family, and, and they respond the same. And, and Joe has seen that and he said right up front, he said, I'm not looking to invent a new wheel. I, I want to keep everybody. And so uh, he's able to keep the, the lady in Albany and uh, she'll be work, actually working for Joe and another member. Uh, he may run the office, you know, a little bit different than I do, but, but um, Lori here and Donnie, um, they're great. They're wonderful people and I think of them just like family. All right, so now what are you looking forward to about retirement? What are you, what are you going to be doing? <laughs> well, I think for one thing, <clears throat> it, I'm, I'm looking forward to just not having to look at my schedule. If I, wanna, if I decide, well, Thursday, let's do this, I don't have to look at my schedule to, to figure out whether I'm able to do it. <laughs> so, you know, just having no schedule for a period of time, I think, will be good. And we're going to spend some time with our grandchildren and I look back at the times that we missed soccer games and basketball games and cheerleading uh, competition. And we always said, well, we're going to do more next year, but it didn't happen. And so last year, we saw this, we ended up seeing the second soccer game of our oldest granddaughter up in Sackets Harbor. And we realized, I realized that that's it. That's her last soccer game. And we, we didn't see any more than we usually do. Only, only last year we saw two. And I, you know, got six more grandchildren in the pipeline here of plays and concerts and so forth. I said, you know what, I, I don't want to be the grandfather that never showed up. And I mean, I love what I do. I, I'm, I'm healthy, I do anything I want. And it was hard to talk to my constituents and say, you know, I'm, I'm gonna give this up. Because I had people say, you can't quit, we need you there. That's the, one of the hardest things for me to do is say, I've, I've got to quit. I've got to go pay attention to my grandchildren and my family and, and be able to spend time with my wife. And she's been a saint through this, and she's been retired now for about three years, but she's always been very, very supportive. And, and if I needed to ask her to go to a Boy Scout dinner with me or, or, or some other function, okay, all right, she would go and very quietly, you know, sit there and enjoy the people. That I, People loved her. People loved her. I always said if she ever ran against me, she'd probably win. So, <laughs> remind me of your wife's name. Barbara. Barbara. Yeah. You know, it occurs to me, and maybe I'm misreading this, but 
I get the sense that you took this job very seriously, that there might have been opportunities for you to sort of slack off, maybe not show up for every single thing. Mm -hmm. You were in the minority anyway. Mm -hmm. it, yet it seems to me that, that you, you had a, a fair amount of respect for the position. I highly respect the position, and um, people have been very kind in saying good things about my, the job that I've done. But I'm very pleased that it's had that effect. I've done my job. I've done the job as best as I could, and I, I never slacked off, really. I, if I felt I had to be at a function, I was there, if I physically could make it. And, and um, sometimes it was tough to juggle, you know, schedules and pick which one you... I tried to pick one main event at night, so I wasn't doing a cameo here and a cameo there and so forth. I, and people respected that. They would often say, when you show up, you stay. You stay for the whole program. And they respected that because everybody needs to feel that their, their organization or, their, or whatever is important, that you were there and you talked to them. I might have made a speech or whatever, but I was there for the whole event as much as I could. Just a, a, a few times here and there, I had to just walk in and say, look, I can't stay, but I got to, you know, Maybe sometimes you get double scheduled on something so that you do the best job you could. But I just always have took it to heart that um, I'm hired to represent the people. And it's my job to carry their voice. And I tried to do that as, to the best of my ability. Any parting message to your constituents? <laughs> I, I'd say just thank you for all your confidence in me over the years and thank you for your support. It's been an honor to serve an honor to represent the people here in the southern tier. I've got many, many great friends, and, and I just, uh, it's, it's been an experience that will not be replicated. So I, I'm just very pleased to be able to leave before people wanted me to leave, I guess. <laughs> and also, just uh, it's been a great experience. I, I've met so many, ni met so many nice people, and, and they're appreciative of what I've tried to do.